Uh, you've probably heard of RLHF. It's a pretty big thing. It's um, kind of what makes models do what you want them to do, as opposed to just generating r random stuff um, or stuff that isn't really aligned with your preferences or human preferences in general, which is why GPT is so good at catering towards human preferences. It's because of our HLF. And this paper proposes a direct method as opposed to using a reinforcement learning method, which implies that it's more stable and probably easier to find or probably easier to um to mess with as opposed to doing a reinforcement learning objective, which is difficult to just if so many hyperparameters, it's difficult to do anything with. So yeah, direct policy or sorry, direct preference optimization. Uh, your language model is secretly a reward model, so pretty cool name. Um, yeah, let's just start. So, yeah, they go through, or they, they kind of talk about um, RLHF in general, which um, I'll go over as well because uh, I kind of I kind of use this to. I wanted to talk about RLHF because it's a very interesting process. So. I kind of use this paper to do that, but yeah, it's still an interesting paper. Anyways, um, yeah, here's the picture that they have. So we'll just go through RLHF step by step and kind of go through the problems with it as well. So let me zoom in here. So first off, whenever you are doing anything with LLMs, you have to collect this massive data set of just just uh, text. Maybe you you collect some text. Maybe this is code. Maybe the, this text. Is, maybe you have a subset of text, which is like code. This define main or something like that. Uh, and then you got you got some Python code. Maybe you got some text that tells you how to build a bomb. Uh, going off of the previous <laughs> uh, video, here's uh, here's how to build a bomb. And maybe you have some more text that just says some some random stuff like uh, I like cats. Got gotta go with the good old good old cats um, text. Always do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So all you do is you take you sample from this data set, and you train your model. It's going to be a transformer model because it's just made to model text, and you basically have it predict. The next word given the context so maybe we're doing the uh the i like cats objective so it'll predict i and then it'll predict like and then it'll predict maybe it'll say dogs so you do the maximum likelihood objective where you maximize the likelihood of um basically the words that you want so dogs would be minimized while the while cats would be maximized in this case and should be in all cases. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyways, yeah. Um, you basically have your distribution over your words. Um, I'm not going to draw it like that. So maybe that's I like dogs, cats. And in this case, the last word would... So the, we're looking at the last word in this case, and maybe it gave a really high probability to that. So you'd want to minimize the probability of dogs and maximize the probability of cats, given the given the context I like. And you do the same for the words I, you do the same for the word like. And this is just maximum likelihood objective. Um, if you're more interested in that, uh, you could probably go look at a, a tr an attention is all you need uh, paper, uh, or the attention is all you need paper, um, like a video on that. But yeah, it's just maximum likelihood, maximizing the likelihood of desired words and minimizing the likelihood of um, undesired, undesired words. And that's all you do to train your LLM. And once you have that, you have this, you have this model and it's really good at predicting the next word, but it's not very aligned. Maybe you don't want it to tell you how to build a bomb. So you say, here's how to build. And it just goes off and it says, yeah, all right, here you go. Here's, here's how to build a bomb. And, uh, maybe it also says it, it likes dogs. And we don't want that. We want it to like cats. So, <laughs> yeah, that's you want you want it to be aligned with your preferences. So this is stage one, and stage one is just 
training the model. So they say here that the uh, matter, the SFT phase RLHF typically begins with the generic pre-training or a pre-trained L uh, LM. So you're you're just training this model on a bunch of text on a, on a large corpus of text. Now your second step is the reward modeling phase. So the way you do the reward reward modeling phase is it has two steps. The first step is data collection. So for your data collection, you will prompt your model. So maybe we have prompt one, and the prompt is tell me how to build a bomb. And we send this through the model. And the model will say, um, sure. And maybe you prompt it again and again and again. Let's just say we prompt it twice. So we prompt it twice. And let's say one time it says sure, and one time it says I cannot uh, do that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, maybe it says something about it being unsafe. So we would mark this first prompt as being unpreferable. Uh, in this case, we would, we would mark it as being unpreferable, and then this one would be preferable. We probably don't want it to tell you how to build a bomb. Um, at least, yeah, you, you probably don't want it to tell the user how to build a bomb. So, uh, yeah, maybe you want to align it so it's, it's a little more safer. Now, if you prompt it again, maybe we have a second prompt, such as, do you like cats? We feed this through the model, and the model says no. And this is clearly unpreferable. But maybe we prompt it again, and it says yes, and this is preferable. Now the humans are doing this. The human, you you give you you have humans kind of prompt the model, and it, they pick between, uh, they pick the preferred prompt between two of the outputs of the model, or maybe you have multiple prompts. Maybe uh, maybe you prompt it ten times, and then you rank the prompts. But uh, it's it's a lot easier to just show the binary example. Um, you can create binary examples from non-binary examples if you have ten. Different. Uh, if you have ten different um, prompts that are te ten different outputs, then you can just select two of them, and you have your binary output. So uh, the binary output gen generalizes. So yeah, you basically just rank one as preferred and one as unpreferred. And humans do this. This is where the human feedback comes from. Now, what you do is you train a reward model. So we have this model. Say we give it prompt two. Uh, in this example, where prompt two is, do you like cats? And uh, we add on the no, and we add on the yes. So it's, do you like cats? No. And do you like cats? Yes. And we feed each of these into our reward model. And then the output will be some score. Maybe the score is, um, I'm going to say five for no and 10 for yes. And the output will be, it is the sigmoid of, uh, it would be in this case, 10 minus five. So, and that would be the output. But um, you can see that the score is higher for yes and the score is lower for no, meaning that it gives a higher reward if you say, if it says yes, if the model says yes, and or a lower reward if the model says no, meaning that uh, you're, meaning that it's better for the model to see us because this is um, a maxim maximization objective, not a minimization. And you train this reward model, given this human feedback, to kind of understand the preferences of the humans doing the ranking. So you would feed it this prompt here, do you like cats? And then you would train the reward model to understand that yes is preferred and no is dispreferred or is, is not preferred. And you do the same for uh, the you tell me how to build a bomb prompt as well. And you would um, maximize the reward for saying, I cannot do that, and minimize the reward for saying, sure, I can do that. And you train this reward model by this objective here, which is pretty intuitive. Um, so YW is, our, oops, uh, YW is our prompt that we want to, uh, is, is the desired prompt and desired response, and YL is the undesired response. And you can see that 
since we have the negative sign out here, we're maximizing this. And that means that you're maximizing the preferred and minimizing the unpreferred. And the, the way you do that is you can make this a binary problem by putting the score in a sigmoid function. So it'll be a one if say the preferred is, uh, I don't know, infinity and uh, this is say zero, something like that, then uh, sigmoid will be a one because it's really high. Uh, if it's, uh, actually I'm not gonna say infinity, if it's a really high number, I don't wanna go into infinities, that'll break things, but yeah. Um, if this is a really high number, and this is a really low number, meaning that it, it ranks the it, it ranks the preferred output very high and the unpreferred output really low, then that is what you want. That's your desired goal of your reward model, and that's what your that's your objective. So your objective for the reward model is just uh, align. It's figuring out what humans want. Humans are not good at saying what they want, but they are good at choosing between two things. And the reward model figures out what humans want, hopefully between these choices. So once you've constructed this massive data set of human preferences and you've trained your reward model, then the third step is to do reinforcement learning using this reward model. So we can go back up to the picture over here. So you would have, say, a prompt. Maybe this is prompt two. Do you like cats? And you feed this through the model. This is your original model and um, you maybe it outputs the word maybe it outputs no and you don't want that so the reward model will say ah i don't like this uh, i'm giving this a score of negative 100,000. i wish that was lower uh i was hoping for negative a million but the reward model said it was only a negative 100,000. but still a really low score <laughs> um then you feed this through you feed this back into the model by using uh reinforcement learning um, you, you basically just use PPO to maximize this reward. So in this case, since it was negative 100,000, then you have a really, you, you, this is a really low score. So the model will have to shift a lot. And uh, you can see that this is the objective here that you are maximizing. So you maximize this with your policy. Your policy here is going to be your model. And you can kind of, like usually, whenever you think of um, a policy, you think of it as uh, being in an, in an environment, taking actions. Well, in this case, each action is each token it produces. And that's the biggest problem. You can't just directly, you can't, you can't directly take this reward. You can't say, okay, model, you have negative 100,000, optimize this. You can't do that. You have to use reinforcement learning to optimize this reward. So... You can use like a P you can use PPO to do this. There's a ton of different algorithms out there, which I'm not I'm not going to get into because that would take forever. Uh, but yeah, you use a reinforcement learning objective to ma for, to have a model maximize this, and it kind of figures out how to do that. But um, yeah, you can see it just maximizes the reward. So the response given the context. So if our context was do you like cats, and it said no, then it would figure out that that's a bad response and maybe it says yes one time and it figures out that's a good response. So it maximizes the yes and it minimizes the no, the, the probability of that. Uh, there's also a second term here, which uh, would minimize, it, it would be minimizing this because you have the negative sign when you're maximizing. So it minimizes the KL divergence between your old model. So you basically have your frozen, uh, they call this ref. So you have you have your model here, and you basically create two copies of your model. You have pi theta and pi ref. And pi ref is going to be frozen, while pi theta is going to be the thing that you train uh, using reinforcement learning. And the goal is to keep them as similar as possible. And this does two things. Um, it, it basically keeps it from dying, I guess, and and uh, turning into complete garbage because you you already know that your model is really good at, at doing uh, next word predictions. It's really, it has a good understanding of text, but if it, it goes too far away from that, then maybe it turns into some stupid model that always repeats the same thing. And that also goes into a reward hacking. Um, reward hacking 
where maybe it figures out, oh, if I just put a bunch of positive words in here, uh, if maybe I just predict the word good over and over and over again, then the reward model is going to be like, oh yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good output. I really like to see you say the word good. Or maybe in our case, it says the word cats a lot. And the reward model is like, yes, I like that. But uh, that's obviously terrible. It's terrible alpha. But, and that's called re reward hacking, where it figures out a way to maximize the reward, even though, but it's not what we want exactly. And if you keep the models the same, then that, that, that prevents that. So that's what you do. You just train a model or you, you train the model on the, you, you fine tune your model, your pre-trained model from up here on the reward model. And one other thing I forgot to point out is that your reward model is also from your initial model. So you usually would have your initial model and maybe you put a head on there um, from one of the lanes that, so this would be like your original model and maybe you put a, um, a linear a linear layer on there to classify if uh, the input text is good or bad. And the reason you just use your old model is because you know your old model is already really good and uh, maybe it even ha like it has a good understanding of the text you're going to be working with. So um, it's also easy to do that. So uh, yeah, you initialize your award model from your old model, but hopefully this makes sense. It's a pretty intuitive task. All you do is train your, your initial model. You train a reward model based off human feedback and, uh, from the old model, and then you do reinforcement learning to update your old model. And maybe you do this multiple times. Maybe you have a new model. Maybe you have pi2, or yeah, we'll say pi, pi new. Maybe you have pi new which is after you do a bunch of after you do reinforcement learning for a lot of iterations and it has a good understanding of what you want but maybe it hasn't figured everything out May, uh, then you can go back to step 2 and instead of using your old model you would use pinu uh, and then it you do you, you collect another data set using pinu you train another reward model and you do this over and over again now the biggest problem with this is re reinforcement learning is just <laughs> annoying to train. Uh, I think they say that here, but yeah, it's it's really, really annoying to train and it, it has a lot of issues. Whenever you're doing reinforcement learning, uh, like one of the, like for example, the reward hacking, that's one of them. The number of hyperparameters you have to do so that it's stable, or you have to tune so that it's stable. There's a ton of those, especially with PPO. PPO has a ton of hyperparameters that you have to train. It's really hard to make stable. So this process is really hard. It takes a long time, it takes a lot of iterations, and it's just not favorable. Now, wouldn't it be better to have an objective just like this, a maximum likelihood objective that uh, does ex that does exactly what we want? And it turns out that's what they do. They turn this reward into a maximum likelihood. And they, they basically just kind of shift the, um, the objective here. So this is our old objective. And they, they shift it so that you can use a maximum likelihood prediction. So instead of you having to implicitly model it through this reward, you can directly model it using maximum likelihood, which is very favorable, a lot more stable, and a lot easier to train. And they also mentioned that it takes a lot less hyperparameter tuning. So they have some, they have a lot of proofs here, but I just want to get to the result because it's, it's a very intuitive goal. So here's, here's the, um, let me zoom out. So here's the objective that they obtain and this is their, their loss. So all the loss is, is you are maximizing and it looks very similar. You're maximizing the, uh, this looks very similar to the reward model. So you maximize this objective and this objective is, uh, let's just look inside the, the sigmoid first. So this objective is saying, uh, we want to maximize the probability of the response W and minimize the probability of the response L where the response W is the response we want. Maybe that's yes to do you like cats? And response L is no to, to do you like cats? And this is basically the reward model objective. 
uh, except they have the the log uh, in, instead they do the log probabilities and uh, they do the log of the sigmoid and they also do the direct um, remember how we had the the KL divergence between the, the the policies so they also have that here where you the the fraction here keeps the policy similar so you want to keep the the new policy similar to the old policy so that it doesn't run into issues and that's all the objective is. The objective is just saying uh, to do this directly. And they say, now we have the probability of human preference data in terms of the optimal policy rather than the reward model. So notice how this is in terms of the policy, pi theta, which they show how to prove that from the original reward objective, not in terms of the reward. And since it's in terms of the policy, you can directly model this with the policy, which allows you to do this maximum uh, likelihood objective. And you just do this for each word. So um, yeah, you just do this for each of the outputs and you do this for each word, just like you do a normal maximum likelihood objective. So all you're doing is you're running this objective on your, um, on your, on your response. So if this was, um, if you give it the context x, such uh, which is how do I build a bomb, maybe you minimize or you maximize the probability of. Sorry, I cannot do that. Um, which would be your your yw and minimize the sure here's how to build a bomb, and that's all you're doing. It's very intuitive. It's just taking the reward model, or it's taking the reward objective and turning it into uh, the policy objective. So you're directly modeling the policy instead of indirectly modeling it using the reward model. So it's very intuitive. Uh, and I like how I like how intuitive it is. Just it's very nice. And they say this way we simultaneously uh, bypass the explicit reward modeling step while also avoid the need to perform reinforcement learning optimization. So you directly skip the the second step here. Uh, you, you skip half the second step. So you still have to do this first step, and you still have to collect the data, but you don't have to have these two here. You don't have to create the reward model, and you don't have to train using reinforcement learning. Instead, you take this data here and feed it directly into your model, as opposed to taking the, um, yeah, and you feed that directly into your reward model instead of directly into your policy model, your old model, instead of feeding that into the reward model. So it's a lot easier and it's a lot more efficient. Um, they also mention that, uh, I forget where they mention it, but it takes a lot less hyperparameter tuning. They also show the gradient, which is um, the gradient of the loss, which is nice to see. So this is maximizing um, since it's negative. You're maximizing this since it's a, it's a loss. And there's, there's three parts to it. So there's this inner part here. And the inner part here is, uh, this is the gradient of the policy, or this is the gradient of yeah, the policy uh, with given the prompt. So you, you give it the prompt, maybe this is, uh, and this is your positive, this is your positive output. So this may be, do you like cats? And this would be yes. And this is your, your negative. So this would be, do you like cats? And this would be no. And all this is saying is you increase the likelihood of it saying yes and decreasing the likelihood of it saying no. And you weigh this by how incorrect it is. And you can, interestingly, it, it does model the reward here where the reward is, um, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this does. So this is, this is kind of like the reward estimate here. And it's implicitly in the model. And what you what this term does is it weighs the model by how wrong it is. So let's say it it said it was really it said no with um very high probability, maybe ninety nine percent probability, and it said yes with one percent probability, then this term would be a lot higher, meaning that the the gradient is a lot larger, shifting it uh, in opposite directions where yes, uh, the gradient, it pushes um, yes to be a higher probability and no to be a lower probability. And that's what this term does. It says the more incorrect you are, the, the higher this, uh, the, the, the higher 
uh, or the, the more you have to kind of shift the um, the probabilities. And it's kind of interesting looking at the gradients to see where it um, where it comes from and or uh, how 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 it's being optimized. And you can see it's pretty directly optimizing uh, to increase the probability and decreasing the probability of undesired. So yeah, I thought that was interesting as well. But um, yeah, so they they also have the the outline here. The general outline is one sample the completions from the the policy, and that would be your old policy. For every prompt, uh, label them with human preferences to construct the outline data set of preferences. And now you have your data set of, of preferences of uh, where YW is your preferred and YL is your dispreferred. Uh, and that would be you collecting the data set using human feedback. And then two, optimize the language model by theta to minimize the DPO loss for uh, a given pi reference, which is just pi theta but frozen, and uh, D and desired beta. Uh, beta is just some parameter you have to, you have to kind of fine tune. Uh, since the preferred data sets are sampled using pi SFT, which is your initial model. We initialize pi reference to pi SFT whenever available. However, when pi SFT is not available, so uh, whenever pi SFT, whenever your initial model is available, you just initialize it to that. But whenever it's not available, they initialize the reference model by maximizing the likelihood of the preferred completions that, uh, so using a subjective, where you just directly, uh, you, you kind of have this starting model where it just maximizes the likelihood of the the preferred completions. It doesn't care about the dispreferred completions. And that's just a good starting point if you don't have the initial model. Now they have this theoretical analysis, which I'm not going to get into. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at. Uh, I kind of find the result to be more interesting, but if you're interested in the proofs here, you can go ahead and um, check them out. Uh, yeah, they also show instability of actor critics, so PPO and or, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback is very unstable, like we've been saying. Now, they have these experiments here, which are interesting to look at. So first off, let's look at what models they use. So uh, they, they explore prompting, or they explore a bunch of different models. So two of the the main ones I want to look at are there's a there's a pseudo supervised method which they call unlikelihood, which simply optimizes the policy to maximize the probability assigned to YW, and to minimize the probability assigned to YL. We use an optimal coefficient alpha uh, between zero and one on the unlikelihood term. So this is sim this is a similar uh, this this is very similar, except they do direct optimization. So they they just make this a uh, they make this a likelihood objective, a direct likelihood objective. Notice that this is uh, not a direct likelihood objective, and they obtain this from the reward objective. Uh, this is not this isn't a direct likelihood objective. It's it's kind of um it's kind of indirect in a way. While this model down here, which they look at called unlikelihood, is a direct, it's, it's a direct objective, just like you would do in the initial training phase. So there's nothing really special about it. It's direct. It's, it's basically like um, normal fine tuning. If you were to normally fine tune something, you would just do your maximum likelihood objective, where you maximize the likelihood of preferred words and minimize uh, dispreferred words. It's not doing reward modeling while well, this paper, DPO, does reward modeling implicitly. Uh, they also have this model called best of n, where they sample n responses from the SFT model and return the highest scoring response according to a reward function learned from the uh, preference data. So they have this reward function and they just, they, they basically f take the original model and they give it the prompt, say, 128 times. I think that's what they use, 128. Uh, n is equal to 128. And then they just pick whichever output maximizes the uh, reward. Now, let's look at the results. So reward, in this case, um, I mean, they, they, they use um, GPT-4 for the reward. 
So let's go to that. Where is that at? Yeah, so using GPT-4 as a proxy for human evaluation of summary quality and response helpfulness. Uh, yeah, so they, they use GPT-4, we conduct a human, and they also conduct a human study of GPT-4 for evaluation. So they use GPT-4 to, to give it the reward, basically. Uh, yeah or to, to kind of evaluate these models. And you can see uh, in this case, uh, to, to, to do a win rate. Uh, in this case, uh, I mean, I guess this one doesn't really matter. Uh, I don't know, this one's good. So on the bottom here, you have uh, pi theta, the, the KL divergence of pi theta and pi ref. So as this value gets higher, that means that your new policy is further away from your old policy. And this is the reward, and this is on IMDB sentiment generation. So given a movie review, uh, make it positive. So that's what you're doing. And you can see that as the policy goes away from the old policy, it does better, which is what you would expect. I mean, yeah, as long as it's not too far away. Now the sampling temperature, uh, that's just kind of how creative it is in a way, I, I would say. Uh, that's how I would put that. Uh, there's, uh, I, th I think the sampling temperature comes from the Gumbel softmax distribution, but not entirely sure. And this is a win rate, and you can see that DPO does really well uh, compared to the other objectives. Here's your best of 128, and best of 128 should do really well because you're sampling 128 times and you can see it does pretty pretty well. Um, but DPO beats all them. And this is on TRDL summarization or TLDR summarization, where given a Reddit post, make a summary. So these two examples aren't super interesting. This third example though is basically chat, chat GPT like So uh, this is best of 128. That's the green one here. And you can see DPO eventually beats it, but best of 128 is is like the maximum is, is like a good upper like a kind of kind of upper bound. Uh, that's what you would expect. Uh, you want to beat that best of 128, and if you beat that, then that means that your model's doing really well. So yeah, you could, I mean you can see it does does really well in general. Um, yeah. So those are some of the results, uh, right? They also have unlikelihood and PPO here, uh, which I forgot to show. And you can see that unlikelihood and PPO do good, but not as good. Um, that would be, uh, and then there's unlikelihood also here. So yeah, I mean, it's it a DPO clearly does better than the than the alternatives, and. One last thing before a stop, uh, before the stop reading the paper is they have um, this analysis here, where it, so they use GPT-4 to do the evaluations, but they also wanted to ensure that this was aligned with humans, and they show that humans agree with GPT-4 as much as they agree with each other. So uh, yeah, compare comparing humans and GPT-4 or human GPT-4 win rates and per judgment agreement to TL DR summarization samples, humans agree with GPT-4 about as much as they agree with each other. Each experiment compares a summary from the stated method with a summary from PPO with temperature zero. So this is the uh, preference of DPO over PPO uh, and uh, GPT-4, it, se it seems that humans prefer DP. Yeah, so DPO pretty much beats uh, SFT and PPO. I think SFT is another reinforcement learning objective. Uh, and humans also do this uh, where it's, uh, yeah, humans versus human agreement. And uh, yeah, so this, this, is, this, this upper part here is uh, the ratings. So this is, um, GPT-4's win rate percentage, and I mean, you can see DPO does better. The percentages are a lot higher for DPO. And in this case, it's how much do humans agree with GPT-4. And about 70% of the time, 
Uh, they humans agree with GPT-4 on the DPO objective about 85% of the time. Humans agree with GPT-4 on the PPO objective, but uh, what you want to look at is how much they agree with each other versus how much they agree with GPT-4. And humans agree with each other about as much as they agree with GPT-4, uh, according to this study. So that shows that GPT-4 does is a, is a good metric for evaluation, according to this. And um, yeah, so that's what this chart's telling you, that DPO, DPO is a lot better than PPO, and that GPT-4 is a good evaluation metric. And they also have some code uh, samples here. They have a bunch of proofs, if you're interested. Um, yeah, here's some, the, it's, it's very simple to implement. It's, it's just, because uh, it's just a maximum, it's a, it's a likelihood uh, maximization objective. That is the paper, DPO. I'm gonna, uh, I'll probably play around with this at some point, but yeah, uh, hopefully Hugging Face implements it because then I won't have to try to do that. But yeah, I thought it was an interesting paper and kind of um, forces me to look at uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback a little bit more. But there we go, DPO.